On this week's video, we're gonna just show you how we start our first lesson with a little Labrador puppy. Spring is in the air. Everyone should be thinking about either getting their puppy or how they're starting to train it. Hi, Charlie Thorburn here from Mordor Gun Dogs. We're just trying to catch a little bit of a gap between the black rain thunderstorm clouds and the bright blue spring, you know, spring weather. Um, a minute ago, it was absolutely lashing with rain. Um, so uh, we're just gonna grab a little puppy and we're gonna do a little bit of training and show you how we start, you know, what we would be doing with a brand new puppy that we get home at 10 weeks old and just show you where you should start, what you should be encouraging and discouraging, etc. So we're just gonna go and get a puppy and I'll be back with you in a second. So where do we start with a, um, a puppy? So this guy here is, he's actually about 11 weeks, so, you, so 12 weeks, so you might have, you know, you might have got your puppy at eight weeks. We tend to let ours go at 10 weeks. We like them to be a bit more robust. You can see this guy, he's pretty robust, weighs a ton. Um, I think I'm gonna call him Thunder just because of the weather today. And it's just quite a good name because he thunders around with his great big feet. So this is a little puppy that we bred. Um, we've kept three of them out of the litter and uh, we're gonna see, follow their training. So where do we start? Do we put them on a slip lead? No, too young. Everyone always starts to do everything too quickly. This is a 11 week old puppy, okay? So two months, two and a half months old. He's like a two and a half year old kid. We're not worried about maths lessons and English lessons and reading. We're just worried about him being a nice, happy little person who just wants to follow us around and, and just gets lots of sleep, lots of food and grows and has fun. I see so many people who, who you know, they're desperate to kind of have their dog doing tricks at 12 weeks old and they followed some, <laughs> some guide on YouTube. <laughs> Don't listen to anything here on YouTube, it's all bollocks. Uh, they've listened to some guide on YouTube which tells them what are oh, the puppy stages are the most important and yeah, they are. Leave them bloody alone, let them be puppies, let them have fun. Just stop being a pushy parent, stop trying to get them to do all these fancy tricks. Because do you know what happens with kids that generally what happens with kids that get pushed and pushed and pushed. They're all doing drugs by the time they're 15. They're like, screw you to the system, we're gonna mess around. Whereas the ones who just like given a nice, a nice kind of, you know, happy childhood, they turn into nice, happy people. And this is what we're trying to do with this guy here. So he has um, a big outside pen, about six or eight car parking spaces. Um, it's grass, he's got a sleeping box to go and hide out of the rain. And he's in there with his brothers and his two sisters and also a, a cocker spaniel. And they just have fun and they go to sleep when they want to, they get up when they want to. And I know not everyone can have the same setup as us, okay? It's not realistic and not everyone can have two, three, four puppies for them to play with each other. But I'm just making you understand how we do it. We're actually gonna be part of a, uh, a study done by Glasgow, some, a couple of PhD students at Glasgow University about the effects of um, puppies leaving their homes as, as puppies, teeny puppies, eight weeks, 10 weeks, as opposed to puppies who stay in their natural environment for longer. And you know, we sell puppies at 10 weeks old, but it's not a natural thing to do to take them away from their mum and their siblings. So often people are like, oh, how do I stop them biting? Or how do I stop them doing this? It's kind of like, if you watch this guy and his sisters playing, they've got each other's ears and they're pulling them around and they've got their legs and then they get a hold of their tail and they're dragging each other around backwards. It's what they do, they're like horrible little kids. They're sort of ragging each other around, throwing pillows at each other. I got, I, got, uh, I got attacked. Um, I got attacked the other day on the sofa with a pillow flying across the room at my head because I've got two little boys and it's half term and they're bored and they're like, great, let's razz up daddy. You know, that's just the reality. So to expect this guy to not bite my fingers and to not jump up and sort of try and get a, steal a shoe or a sock or whatever, it's just not realistic. You've just got to manage it and be and be uh, be aware that you know he's going to need to do that stuff. His little teeth, he's got his little baby teeth. They need kind of something to do, and then he's going to get his big teeth in a few months, and they're going to need something to do. It's itchy, and it just like he just wants to get in there and get it chewing. So you can't stop them. You can discourage it. Every time they jump up at you and they start getting overexcited, you can walk away. You can you literally just put your hands up and just go, I'm not talking to you, and just walk away. But what you'll also find is that it happens at certain times of the day. Once you start to get to know your puppy, you'll see that at 5.30, 6 o'clock every night, you'll get the witching hour, okay? And he'll just have a little bit of extra energy he needs to burn off or, or he'll, um, he'll just be getting tired maybe even and he wants to start chewing because he's getting frustrated. It could be any number of reasons. Don't try and read into it, but just know that at 6 o'clock every day, your puppy turns into a bit of a monster. So at five to six, take him out into the garden. 
at 10 to 6. Take him out in the garden, then put him in his crate for a bit with a bone or change it, change it up, change the routine so that whatever's going to happen can no longer happen because you know it's going to happen. So don't go, oh yeah, every night he does this, what do I do? Every time I go down the road and don't brake on the car, I end up crashing it. What do I do? It's pretty bloody obvious, isn't it? You change, you change what you're doing so that you're working around what's going to happen, okay? You can't stop it. You can't stop it. You can't tell him, no, get down. No, don't bite me. He doesn't care and he doesn't know. He's the puppy. He doesn't speak any language, let alone English. So you've got to work with him um, and think, how can I make this work without falling out with my little puppy? Right, next, what else do we do? Most important thing with a puppy is you want to spend your whole life trying as best you can to get away from him. The faster I go, the more he's going to follow me around. Now, when he's following me around, I'm engaging with him. I'm looking at him going, hello, little man. You want to come with me? Pop, 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 pop. What a good little boy. What a good little boy. So I'm showing him that being here next to me is a good thing to do. Now, if I stop, pull my phone out my pocket and start talking to my pal, at some point, oh, there he goes. He's got bored, okay? Because I'm no longer engaging with him. Thank you. Good little memory retrieved though. He remembers me throwing that lead down a few minutes ago. So I go back, I get his attention and I re-engage with him. Hello, you're gonna come with me? Come on, little man. He's having a little chew, a little mouthful of grass. Oh, what's that? That looks fun. He's a puppy, of course he's gonna do this sort of stuff. Oh, he's eating grass. Oh, what shall I do? Now, what everybody does here, the dog picks up a bit of grass. They go, no, 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 leave it. Now, if every time you did something that you just inherently want to do, because you're a Labrador, picking things up, someone goes, no, 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 leave it. Do you think you're gonna stop? Do you think that ingrained, it's like breathing to them. You're not gonna stop them, you're not gonna stop someone breathing because it's just what they have to do to survive. With a Labrador, picking things up is just what they have to do to survive. They can't help themselves. So if he picks up a bit of grass or a stone or a stick, don't say, no, 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 leave it alone, because what you get is not a dog that drops it, it's a dog that goes, I know I'm not allowed this, so I'm gonna run away and eat it. What we wanna do is say, what have you got? You've got a stone. That's so clever, thank you very much. Take it out and take it out of his mouth, behind my back. It's gone, distract him, move off, move away from the stone, get rid of the stone, okay? The worst thing you can do is get on his case because then he's going to go, oh, she's going to come and take it. I'm going to swallow it. Or picking it up in front of him and going, leave it. Because what's he going to do? He's going to go over and chase it. Now, there was a little momentary interlude there where, the, where Little Thunder, Little Thunder did a wee because that's obviously another big important part of, how, of his life at the moment is house training. We've got to get him outside for a pee. So we're just going to have a quick chat about that. If you uh, take your dog out onto the lawn for a pee, don't sort of go, come on, come on, let's do, 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 like I was just now, because he's not going to pee. You need to just walk around, keeping an eye on him, but just allow him to just have a bit of time. So generally I would just, if I'm wanting a dog, I've just let them out of their cage because we're big crate trainers, big fans of having them in the crate. Every time they're in a crate, they come outside. They come outside for a wee, okay? First thing we do, we wake them up, we open the crate, we get them straight outside. Now, when we're outside, we just walk around, kind of like this, not particularly engaging with the puppy, but I'm just slowly walking around the garden and I'm watching him all the time. Now, he's not gonna do a wee because he's just done one. But as they do a wee, I say, good boy. And what I will generally do is I will also say, have a wee, okay? So as he's doing it, I'll say, have a wee, have a wee, have a wee. And I do it in a soft, encouraging tone of voice because I want him to associate having a wee with me saying have a wee. Now, why is that useful? Why is that useful? Because when I've got older dogs with me away in the car, I'm driving down to London in a few weeks to doing some filming with some dogs, okay? That's one to watch out for, it's gonna be quite funny. Um, um, it could all go really wrong. But anyway, we're gonna drive down to London. Now from here, to Tea Bay services, I'm gonna give them a big shout out because I stop there all the time when I'm going up and down the motorway. Best service station in the UK. Um, Tea Bay services in Lancashire, it from here is about three hours. So the dogs get a run here, we get in the car and we drive three hours. We get to Tea Bay and we can let them out for a run again. But as soon as I get them out of the car, okay, 
I just literally point at a bit of grass and I say to the boys, have a wee. And within 30 seconds, they've all, all the girls, all the boys have had a wee because they just know that command. They know we're out, we have a wee, that's what we do. So we don't have to spend ages wandering around trying to get them to go to the loo because we've taught them from day one. So every time they say, we say, every time we see them having a wee, we, we say, have a wee, have a wee. So they associate it with having a wee. They learn by association, okay? We're not squeezing a wee out of them and saying, have a wee. We're just waiting for it to happen. And then they learn to associate by it. Now, people say, oh, do I do the same for a number two? Now, I ask you the question, if someone says, go over to the bush there and have a wee, most of us, especially us boys, can go over there and have a wee. If someone says, go over there and have a number two, how's that gonna work out? Probably not quite so well, okay? So it's, it's less realistic. With number twos, you've just gotta figure out their time schedule, work out when they're gonna do it. If they haven't done one today, then you need to be up with them at 10 o'clock at night, encouraging them around, walking around the garden until they've done one, because they're gonna need to do one. Um, but that's much more sort of suck it and see and learn the routine the dog, the dog gets into. Um, but with, with a wee, you can definitely encourage them to do it on command. So it's a really useful thing to do. So what have we done? We've done running away from them. Play, like engaging with them, but running away from them so they follow us. We've maybe done a little bit of sitting, for like this guy here. Hey, sit. Good man, well done. We're not gonna get him to sit and stay though. We just want him to sit down. Now we do that every time we feed him. So we hold his food up, we say sit, he sits down, we give him his food. Very simple, it's about the only treat training I'm really an advocate of is when they're little puppies teaching them to sit for their food. So we're not doing on the lead. We're not doing anything with a lead, okay? We're just, he's way too young to be on a lead. He's not on a harness either, he's on nothing. I see people, I saw someone at a show the other day, an event, a country event, walking around with a puppy smaller than this. So probably this age, just maybe not as heavy set, not as well built as this guy, on a lead, walking around a show. And I'm like, oh my God, if that was one of my puppies, I'd be absolutely going ballistic at them. In the garden only. They don't need to go for a walk and they certainly don't need to walk around the show because you're going to ruin their legs. You're going to give them injuries. People talk about um, five minutes a month of exercise. So five minutes, add another five minutes the next month, another five minutes the next month. I absolutely agree with that. But don't start until they're six months old. So when they're three, four, five months old, they're just playing in the garden. When they're six months old, we then add in. Sorry, a van went past, so he just got distracted. So I've got to be on my toes all the time. So I think another van's about to come past. So there's another distraction. So I'm distracting him. Good little man, you look at me. Well done, good little man and the distraction's gone. Prevention is better than cure. How do I stop my dog from getting run over? Don't bloody let it happen in the first place. Watch your dog. So where were we? We were doing, we were doing sitting, so we're encouraging them to sit for their food. We're not doing lead training. Absolutely no. Don't need to go for a walk. Don't need to be on a lead. If people say, oh, I haven't got a garden. To be honest, you shouldn't have got a dog. That's, I'm pretty brutal about that. If you haven't got some sort of garden to let your puppy out for a wee, you shouldn't have a dog. Oh, I live in a flat. Again, brutally honest, I wouldn't sell you a, a puppy. If someone proved to me that they were really like, a dog was gonna fit their life, just not their home, then yeah, fine. I might sell them a trained dog, an older dog that can kind of hold on for longer and understands going up and down the stairs and outside for a walk. But you can't have a puppy thundering down the stair, three flights of stairs every, every two, three hours to, to go to the loo because it's gonna knacker their elbows. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Down all these steps, it's just not gonna be helpful. So out in the garden for little bits of exercise, little and often, every, every few hours. Every time he comes out the crate, he goes outside, he has a wee, he plays around, we do a little bit of training. That little bit of training is, come on, running away from him, engaging him to follow us around. Come on, little man, up, 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 up. good little man, come on in, good boy. Engaging with him to follow us around, okay? All of this is done now. I've got a big garden, I've got lots of space, I'm very lucky, but I'm just doing this in this small area just to show you I don't need to go off into the middle distance. Just in this small area, I can do all this stuff that I want to do. We're not on a lead, I'm gonna repeat it again. He is not going on a lead for another month or two at least, okay? I want him to be a baby. I'm not forcing a pencil into his hand, giving him a rucksack, telling him to go and listen in class. He's a baby, so it's not gonna happen. And then the last thing is, he's a Labrador retriever. So from day one, hey little man, what's this? From day one, we're throwing balls for him. Now, as soon as he picks it up, as soon as he picks it up, we back away, 
encourage him back. Good little man, well done, well done. Now I'm not quick to take it off him. I'm praising him for being at my feet here. Good boy, and then sliding it out of his mouth. Now I've got his attention and he's like, oh, I want another one. So what I would do now is I'd do a little bit more walking around, a little bit more getting him to follow me, a few more sits maybe with his ball, and I might give him one more retrieve, but I'm really limiting it. Certainly don't want to see someone throwing a ball, throwing a ball, throwing a ball, throwing a ball. Because there's two things that can happen. I, well, more than two things, but the two things that worry me. One is you make your dog like one of these obsessed, crazy dogs in the park who are literally like, I've got a ball, I've got a, it's like running up to anybody, throw the ball for me, I need to, I need to throw the ball. They've got like serious sort of mental disorders. They just need the ball thrown. And that, that has been, that's been, that's definitely something that's been learnt. For, they've been taught that by their owners who throw a ball, throw a ball, throw a ball, throw a ball, throw a ball. Of course, it's going to make the jog, dog neurotic. Imagine, you know, throw a ball, throw a ball, throw a ball. I'm, I'm being facetious, but I'm also being realistic. We do one, we have a little break, we might do another one. So that's one of the problems. The second problem with dogs is they're running after the ball and they're twisting and spinning and turning and their joints aren't strong enough and you're putting ex excess pressure on their joints as they're turning corners and they're going to end up with knee problems and elbow problems and all sorts of things. In the same way you would if you had a little kid and you were forcing them to run 5K at three years old, you're forcing them to do 5K runs, you're going to probably give them like bandy legs and dodgy knees. It's just, just real reality. And then the other thing that can happen is if you do too much of it, they actually get bored of it and they don't want to do it at all. So it's just getting a, doing a few to keep that enthusiasm, a few to kind of make sure he he's wants to do it, but not too much that he gets bored or not too many that he gets mental about it. So you can see he was quite keen watching me and then when I started talking to you again, uh, he lost interest, so he's gone off, he's eating some grass. So I throw him, show him the ball, sit. Good little man. I throw the ball now, when he comes back, I'm not trying to get the ball, I'm trying to get his, I'm going to try and get him into me, so I've got, got him there. Now, by holding him in nice and gently here, I've actually got him. He can't go anywhere. If he tries to run off, I would just put a bit more pressure on him. But being a nice little guy that he is, he wants to just sit here with it in his mouth. So I hold his chin up. I'm talking to his ears. I'm making this the most pleasant experience of, uh, possible. Good little man. What a good boy. He's looking him in the eye. He's really happy and confident with all that. And then I just slide it out of his mouth. Now, I know that he's quite likely to jump up after I get the ball. So I then do this sort of weird John Cleese kind of funny walks. Anyone who remembers that from the 80s, you're as old as I am. Um, but by moving just, I don't want to go get down and knee him in the face, but I'm just preventing. So I'm just making sure that I'm not going, look, jump up at me, boom. And then he gets in the habit of jumping up. So all the things we're doing with a young dog like this is all about what do we want the dog to do for the rest of their life? Let's encourage it from now. What do we want the dog not to do for the rest of their life? Let's discourage it from now. Don't go, oh, he's just a puppy. We'll worry about that later. Because at what point do you go, oh shit, we better sort that out. Normally by then it's too late. You've really ingrained that habit. Dogs don't come out pulling on a lead. They don't come out, and I'm talking about being born. They don't come out pulling on the lead, running away, chewing stuff. You know, they, they, it's, it's all sort of learnt behavior. If you encourage it, Great, if you discourage it, even better. You know, you've just got to figure out what you're doing um, uh, and what you're, what you're not going to be doing. So remember that list. All the things you want them to do, encourage them from now. All the things you don't want them to do, discourage them from day one. I don't want him jumping up. I don't want him running away. I don't want him chewing a tennis ball. So I'd never leave this tennis ball with him. I'd always encourage him to bring it back. I don't want him pulling on a lead. So I'm not going to put him on a lead at the moment because he's simply not mentally mature enough to understand the concept of what I'm, I'm asking him to do or not to do. What I do want him doing is paying attention to me. So when he pays attention to me, I look back at him and I talk to him. What a good little man. What I do want him doing is retrieving a ball and bringing it back to me. So I, I encourage that from the very beginning. What I do want him doing is following me around and just engaging with me and wanting to be with me. So I encourage that from the beginning. They've got a very short concentration span, okay? They're like a little, you know, little kid. They're like doing something and then, oh, I'm going to drop this toy. I'm going to go over there. And oh, I'm going to drop this toy. I'm going to go over there. And then there's like the, the house is littered with different games that they've got different puzzles. They started that one. Then they've gone into this one. It's just how it is. So you, you can't expect to go out with your puppy for an hour on a Saturday because you haven't done any training all week. It's, it's just a few minutes every day, 10 minutes at the most, but normally less. So you've got to be really careful that you don't overdo it. And, uh, and then, you know, you get the most out of the puppy. One of the most important things 
the, the top tips I would give to you, be consistent, okay? Be consistent with your dog. Whatever you get the dog to do, don't change it the next day. Don't try and do something different because you didn't think it was working. Um, uh, keep it short, okay? Don't overdo it because the dog's gonna get bored. So just get something right and then quit while you're still ahead. Uh, remember it's a baby, it is not, it's not an adult dog. Don't try and get it to jump through hoops of fire when it's 12 weeks old, it's a baby. Okay, just let it do baby stuff. So consistency um, is, is the most important. Uh, remembering that it's a baby, don't do too much. Keep it short and sweet, I guess that would be. So consistent, short and sweet, um, and, and little and often. Uh, and those are the, the key things. Now this guy's a superstar, my son Freddie is just here watching the video. Uh, and this little puppy is just sitting watching him. Uh, so don't expect your puppy to be like everybody else's. Don't go, oh, well their puppy's doing this, so mine should be as well. They're all different. If I went and got his sister, she probably wouldn't be doing this. Okay, <laughs> Freddie's now trying to encourage him and he's gonna come over. So good little man, come on then. Good boy. So um, don't expect your puppy to do exactly what everyone else's puppy is doing. And the final thing I'm gonna talk about, because it's just here just now, is socialization. Socialize your puppy, get it used to children, get it used to you, get it used to your house and stuff. But don't start like dragging it off to the park and dragging it to the supermarket and dragging it here, dragging it there, dragging it everywhere. Any of you out there who are watching this who, who've, who've got kids, okay? It's quite often, I do quite a lot of um, comparisons to children, uh, having children. When you, got, when you had your first child and you went home with your first baby, you weren't like inviting all your mates around for a drink and having a party and like everyone, oh yeah, come round, come round. You were like, you got home and you're like, oh my God, I've got this baby. I've got to bloody well grow up and I've got to look after them, okay? And hope they're still alive in, <laughs> in 10 years time. You're not kind of having loads of people around. You're not socializing the baby. You might have your mum or your mother-in-law around. You know, you might have a sister-in-law around, something like really simple, okay? But otherwise you want to just be at home, get in a routine, get your basic stuff, just get the baby like sleeping and eating and you guys catch up on sleep and you guys get into the sort of the, the habit, the right habits and all the good habits. And I don't know what any of those are because I've got a clue because we all did it for the first time. But I'm, from a comparison point of view, it's, it, it's very sim similar. Don't, don't be like, oh, my neighbors want to come and see my puppy. I don't care. I don't care. Wait two, three weeks. Wait until you've got that puppy into a bit of a routine. Don't completely flood the puppy with all this sort of craziness of like everyone coming around all the time. Oh, I want to see the puppy. And the puppy's jumping up and you're trying to get the puppy to stay down. And they're like, it's okay. And you're like, it won't be okay when it's a 40 kilo dog and it jumps up at your wedding, will it? But that's not their, they don't care about that. It's not their responsibility. So it's your responsibility. So you're the one who has to say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to encourage these things. I'm not going to let this happen. So keep it really simple. Keep it really basic and just have a sort of routine that you can follow and minimize what can go wrong. Okay. And those are the real, the sort of the best sort of tips and pointers I can give to you to your sort of first sort of month or two with a puppy. Really simple things. And uh, obviously enjoying the puppy who's licking Freddie's face. Uh, thank you all for watching. Remember you get out what you put in and uh, we'll see you all next time.